In this episode of Detroit Performs, a poet pours her soul into her performances. An organization helps women survivors of abuse on their journeys of recovery. And an artist lens on the immigration system. It's all ahead on this edition of Detroit Performs. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding is also provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Detroit Performs. I'm your host, DJ Oliver, and today I'm taking you to the Art and Soul exhibition showing at the Pontiac Creative Arts Center. I'll be talking to someone about the exhibition later in the show. But first up, let's meet a poet who uses her words to take on important issues facing our community. Here's Tawana Petty. We are Detroiters, the black mecca of possibility. We will not Art, it can be resistance. Art can be visionary. Art has a role in social justice. And if you're an artist, you have a responsibility to create the world you want to see. Also articulate the truth and what's happening. I grew up in Detroit, uh, born and raised. I write every day, at least five minutes in the morning. The impact that art has had on me inspires me to do it. You know, I had a, a kind of a, a tough childhood, and so I remember escaping to my journal. And so I want to create that opportunity, particularly for young people, but for everyone. Like, there is meditation and healing and writing and creating and getting your story out. I used to just write about anything, whether it be relationships, but a lot of my poems are like political now. It's like, I'm, I feel like I'm responding to the moment. Um, and so even though I have like some art that I still create that talks about relationships, that talks about silly things, most times I'm, I'm engaging in what's happening in the world. I'm performing at 9405. John R. is being launched as a bookstore this week, actually. And so I'm happy to do a open mic performance to kind of kick it off for them. I know I'm gonna do a poem that I kind of do as an intro poem that is like my way of introducing myself to people. And it's called If I Never Had a Sin. And it's basically just talking about like, these are the things that I've been through, but had I not gone through those things, then I wouldn't be here. Took me a while before I woke up and stopped pitying me, but took responsibility for my actions. But the fact is, I'm still growing, still learning as I go, and day by day is a struggle, a constant juggle between my home life and work. And I'm gonna do a poem that talks about like loving Detroit, <laughs> because I do. <laughs> a lot like you have been discarded like debris, deemed useless to naysayers and convictors. Yet you keep rising, clinging to vitality. You refuse to allow statistics to dictate your destiny and the media will channel your journey. And then I'll talk about police brutality, particularly um, young black women who are missing from the narrative. They bury us in plain sight. Our brutalized bodies crash to the pavement like shattered dreams. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about love but you do have to be a model for my son. Be willing to make sacrifices for two, not just one, cause we come as a package and I'm not willing to unwrap this for just anybody. I try to speak from my perspective, um, use I statements mostly, but um, also mostly young black children and women uh, particularly. And I do in some of my poetry, I talk to young black men, I talk to people of color, um, and I also just talk about like marginalized and oppressed communities. She travels through life like a tourist, uncomfortable in her own home, inside her own skin, tormented by the demons within her own psyche. She's running from herself, working her fingers to the bone for wealth she'll never find pleasure in having. Stress and waking up are synonyms, and she hates kissing him, but marital obligation says that she must. One-sided lust is the sum of a union she's already mentally divorced from. 
A lot of times the poems come from an emotional place, and so I'm, I try to think about what made me create the poem in the first place. And a lot of times, unfortunately, if the poem is something that's challenging, those conditions still exist, and so it's easy to stay in tune with what the art was about. Um, so it hasn't really been difficult. Uh, I hope someday that those poems will be, you know, a thing of the past and I won't have to. It'll be something I say, you know, historically. Historically, I wrote this poem about, like, racism and sexism, but that's not a thing anymore. I'm hoping that we'll get there, and I think art plays a role in that. The consciousness is shifting, and, and folks want to hear art. They want to hear artists respond and articulate, number one, what's really happening, and number two, a vision for where we go forward. And so now is like it's a movement moment, and it's a prime opportunity for my art to have a voice now where it didn't so much a decade ago. I would be writing poetry about social justice and those things, and folks didn't want to hear that. You know, this was post racial America, and like, we didn't have those issues. I think about the role of art and poetry in like the black arts movement. And then I, re I feel that responsibility to nurture younger people to know that they don't have to wait until tomorrow. Young people have a voice now and they can contribute now. And it's not when you grow up or in the future, it's, it's now. I have some art that speaks particularly to young black girls and young black boys. And it's basically telling them that, you know, you're gonna be told that you're not something and you know I want to tell you that you are you're much more than what you've heard about yourself black child born to black child they will drag you through the mud but stay resilient carve your mark into the wind turn your nose up at the naysayers and leave the world better than you entered it I think that art is a way to re-spirit people, particularly young people. Um, if they feel like they have a voice and their voice is valuable, then they start to behave in a particular manner. We all have a responsibility to create a more humane society. And whether you're an artist, whether you're an educator, whether you're a mom or a father or you're a student, no matter who you are, you have a role and a responsibility to create a better society, to leave places better than you entered them, or at least don't harm them. And so I would ask that whomever you are, take on that responsibility. You are Detroit, the road to progression, the mirror image of endurance and you hold the key to taking back our humanity. Thank you. You can learn more about Tawana Petty as well as all the artists we feature on DetroitPerforms.org. Mend on the Move helps women who are survivors of abuse on their journeys of recovery. The women make jewelry that channels the resilient soul of Detroit while also building confidence and inner strength to help with the next chapter in their lives. for me starting Mend on the Move was in fact my own story of abuse. I grew up being um, a survivor of childhood abuse, sexual abuse, and um, I really didn't begin to heal from that um, until I was an adult and it's been a long journey towards healing. In learning a lot about um, human trafficking and abuse, I, I learned that um, the majority of women who are abused as adults or also were first abused as children. And they never had the opportunity to heal and that has left, led them vulnerable to further abuse and addiction as adults. I saw how effective it was to empower women by having them um, help themselves. I've always been a creative person and I was a jewelry artist before and that's the one thing I thought I could bring to the table was creating jewelry. So Men on the Move was born. Every piece of jewelry that we make has a meaning behind it. And it all goes along with addiction or sex trafficking or whatever is going on with our lives. It's more than just creating jewelry, it's communion. It's like 
um, just being in a, a, a circle of women who have all experienced the same thing and are going, are taking the same journey together. Samiritas House Heartline likes to invite all um, women with all walks of life, regardless of their background, to give them the opportunity to go through our programming here. Our population is very unique with having offenders in here along with homeless women, in addition to human trafficking survivors, which is how I originally met Joanne from Mend on the Move. I, I have seen their personal growth um, expand a lot since Men on the Move came in here. Because when you're in this environment and you're set to do the programming, it doesn't allow for a whole lot of creativity. This allows for that. When I first got to Heartline, I had nothing. And Miss Joanne and Men on the Move helped me focus and sent me on my journey. Men on the Move speaks on how women out here have been through a little struggle and how lives can change. And that means a lot because me personally, I've been through a lot and I've changed a whole lot since I started working and since I've been a resident at Heartline. Joanne's amazing. She makes us feel worthy, wanted. I'm inside a great person, but I have not been a great person for a lot of years and I have a lot of strength and abilities that I have buried and she has brought me out of my shell. Had they not been here I wouldn't be as far as long in my recovery as I am today. Men on the Move and the facility in which I reside has tremendously helped me in strengthening who I am helping me to rehabilitate my, my mind, my body, you know, my thinking, my actions. It gives us a chance to be a part of something because sometimes in life when you make that stumble, you, you don't become a part of something that means anything <laughs> or something that is good, but now you have that opportunity to be a part of something that actually has uh, meaning something that's going to be helpful, something, something big, and Men on the Move is going to be big. When the women um, see their, their jewelry packaged, that's a pretty empowering thing because they are actually, they've created something that is worthy of someone purchasing it. And that's an empowering thing for, for women who really have come from a place where they don't feel any worthiness at all and can't see themselves ever being worth anything. These women that did, were once voiceless now have a voice. With Men on the Move, what we really like try to focus on is the positive aspect, the hopeful aspect, because honestly, these women don't want to be known for just their stories and their past. They're trying to move beyond that, and it's not easy. These women deserve a second chance. They deserve opportunity and, and really grace in, in their life. I think being at the market is it's perfect for us, Easter Market, because we work with women in a recovery program that's actually located in Detroit. Um, our products are made from automotive parts, the whole idea of using the automotive parts, um, to me, was symbolic. Detroit is a role in, in itself is a survivor and is such a comeback city. And that's what our women are all about. They're overcomers. They are tough, they're resilient, and they really are symbolic of Detroit. Something so beautiful can come from something, you know, from the automotive world that is the creative part that I enjoy about it. The customers, when they, when they do uh, see the jury, and they not only think about the women that they're helping, they also think about how they're contributing back to a city that's coming back alive also. We have, a, um, we have one called a tiny spark which allows you to know that at the end of the day, it doesn't take a big blast or a big boom. Just a little tiny spark gives you hope. 
change is possible. And as long as you have good people in your corner or someone there to like help you motivate yourself, then change is always good. It makes us feel like we can, we're starting to get on our feet on our, on our own. We're achieving things that we worked for and it makes you feel wonderful. We are helping women that we don't even know that we've never seen. Some of them have never seen us or know of us. Helping those that were abused or maybe still going through what they're going through. This jury symbolizes that things do change. What's up guys, I am here with Melissa Parks, founder and executive director of Art and Soul program here. How you doing, Melissa? Good, Hi. thanks for having me. So tell our viewers out there on Detroit Performs a little bit about Art and Soul and what it does. We um, reach out to photographers and I share my passion for children mm -hmm. and art and they understand um, that this is an important mission. Mm -hmm. And so they take the children's photos and capture the soul of the child so that we as viewers can really see the children. And um, each one is done by a different uh, award-winning photographer, local photographer. Mm -hmm. And so it makes the exhibit, you know, when people come up to it, there's no labels. Right. There's no label attached to these children. Just like the children in our homes, we don't have labels. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it's pretty palpable. I must, I must say I've been around watching all these different photos here and they've inspired me. I know that particularly the one about Shania and Joshua. That's a particular case I want you to share with the yeah. viewers so out there. So Shania and Joshua are siblings and um, they're looking to be together. Mm -hmm. And when you meet them, they laugh, they talk, mm -hmm. they hug each other mm -hmm. and it makes more real their love. Mm -hmm and they already are enough. And so we need people to take in these stories and these images mm -hmm. and think about what would it look like to have a child in their home. So Art and Soul, does it travel? Does this travel? Is it this... travels to a different location every month okay. in hopes that over a year's time, people see it more than once. Mm -hmm. So what's been the impact of the uh, audiences that have seen these uh, exhibitions? Uh, people are moved to action. 50% of the children were matched with the pre-adoptive family from last year, which is huge. Mm -hmm. And we've been to two success adoptions okay. since then and two more on the horizon All right. and um, we feel that this is important work and that uh, the children are then surrounded with a family and a network that can help them reach their hopes and dreams. Absolutely, and, so we like yeah. that. Yeah. So thank you Melissa Parks thank you. for talking to thank us, we appreciate you. that. Thank you. Alright guys, now check out some upcoming events happening in and around the D. Up next, we take a look at the immigration system through an artist's lens. Nobody see, never see what's going on in the detention. But Douglas Menhivar witnessed firsthand what happens in immigrant detention facilities. The El Salvador native was held for two years after being detained by Immigration and Customs Enforcement in Texas. And now I stayed outside, I want to explain a lot of people what's going on in the detention. This is, this is my, my purpose. To further that purpose, Menhivar joined Sinuelas, a group of activists and artists. 
Using detainees' stories and an artist's eye, they created Detention Nation, which simulates what life is like for undocumented immigrants held, many without due process, at detainment facilities in the United States. These are the actual people that have been affected. To remind visitors of that, members of the collective like artist Delilah Montoya created ghost-like silhouettes to represent detainees. I was interested in making a statement that wasn't necessarily documentary but had an emotion or a feeling to it where it began to suggest where the population was, where the, the detainees were, in that they're not here nor there. They were kind of caught in between the system itself. Museo de las Americas in Denver is the second venue in the country to host the exhibit. It immerses visitors in the sights and sounds of a detention center. People wrapped in mylar blankets, the murmur of voices, and doors clanking shut. Everything is under surveillance. Museum curator Maruka Salazar said the work is meant to emphasize the impact the immigration system can have on people. Ancient relationships are very crucial in migration patterns. Well, might be erased by, by humans, but they have been here for thousands of years. So we can't really say we have nothing to do, or this is not part of our culture, or this is not part of our historical tradition or memory. It is very much a part of us. And specifically here in Colorado, because Colorado is like a, a migration pattern. It's a place of transition between the West and the East. So right here at the center of the, of the country, this is the place where we really need to um, pay attention to what's going on. If you have never been in a detention center, you truly experience the idea of incarceration. You know, one tone floor, you know, wire fences, uh, flashing cameras, picking up every movement that you do. All of those things impact you psychologically. And so when you leave here, you feel like you've been sitting in a very oppressive space. That oppressive treatment still plagues former detainee Douglas Menjivar. He was sexually assaulted twice in detention and now suffers from PTSD. He described crowded conditions, limited access to medical care, and no privacy. When you want to go for the bar room or something, every, everybody see you, what you, you do. And when you need to take a shower, everybody see you when you have to take a shower. His account of the poor conditions are echoed in letters written by other detainees, which are included in the exhibit. One even described it as El Infierno, hell. Menjivar's time in detention was rife with uncertainty, which he said is typical for detainees. He didn't know when his case would be heard by a judge or if he would be released. One day, a guard simply presented him with a form written in English. Sign this paper. I can't sign because I don't know what is that. And, and it's, it's, it's in English. I don't speak very well English. Say, so don't worry, this paper is for you get out for this right now. Uh, I, I don't believe in her because it's ICE people, you know. Ultimately, he signed the document and was released. But why was he released? It's a good question. We don't know. The former police officer does know he's afraid to return to his native El Salvador. Since his release from detention, he has secured a work permit and is awaiting a hearing with ICE. I know one in one people more is doing assault or sexual in the detention. Take care more immigrants because uh, in the in the detention, nobody take care of you. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. As always, for more arts and culture, head to DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on coming arts events. Also, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. I'd like to thank Art and Soul and the Pontiac Creative Arts Center for letting us share this beautiful and important exhibition right here on the show. Until next Tuesday, get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I'm DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by
Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marilad cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding is also provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.